keep going in 1 Samuel. We're in chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, an interesting place in the text. Because 1 Samuel, uh, you know, is the transition point from the judges to uh, the kingly rule of the Israelites. And so we're moving from the transition of leadership from um, anointed people uh, coming one by one to the lineage of David, uh, which is upon us. Uh, But it's going to take a little while to get there, and we have to get through Samuel's leadership, which he will then anoint Saul, and then Saul will fail, and then God will anoint David as the uh, leader of Israel. And it's out of the house of David through which we come to the Savior, Jesus. But we're going to take a little aside from Samuel here in chapter 4. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 of 1 Samuel. Actually, we leave Samuel for a little bit and we uh, pass into a, a, a side about the Ark of the Covenant, okay? And when I mention the Ark of the Covenant, those of you who are my age probably have something come to mind. Raiders of the Lost Ark, okay? The Indiana Jones movie. And by the way, the new Indiana Jones movie's out and I saw it uh, a couple days ago with my son. You can ask him for his review since he's the movie guy. Uh, I enjoyed it because I'm an Indiana Jones fan, but anyway, the true review is right there. You can ask him later. But that's not the Ark that we're talking about, okay? We're talking about the real Ark of the Covenant, okay? So let's read 1 Samuel 4, verses 1 through 11 together. Or I'll read, you follow along, and then we'll talk about this text. And Samuel's words came to all Israel. That's the last mention of Samuel Samuel now for the next three chapters. Israel went out to meet the Philistines in battle and camped at Ebenezer while the Philistines camped at Aphek. The Philistines lined up in battle formation against Israel. And as the battle intensified, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who struck down about 4,000 men on the battlefield. When the troops returned to the camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord defeat us today before the Philistines? Did you catch that question? Why did the Lord defeat us today? Not why did we suffer defeat, but they attributed their loss to God. Interesting, huh? We'll talk about that. Let's bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh. Then it will go with us and save us from our enemies. So the people sent men to Shiloh to bring back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord entered the camp, all the Israelites raised such a loud shout that the ground shook. The Philistines heard the sound of the war cry and asked, what's this loud shout in the Hebrews camp? When the Philistines discovered that the ark of the Lord had entered the camp, they panicked. A God has entered their camp, they said. Woe to us. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who will rescue us from these magnificent gods? These are the gods that slaughtered the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Show some courage and be men, Philistines. Otherwise, you'll serve the Hebrews just as they served you. Now be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. And each man fled to his tent. The slaughter was severe. 30,000 of the Israelite foot soldiers fell. The ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. This is the word of the Lord. When a person today, when someone says, I believe in God, and you press them on that belief, what does it mean to believe in God? It becomes apparent for a number of people that they really can't define what that means, to believe in God. G-O-D, God, 
for many people does not mean what is spelled out in the Bible, right? In many cases, it's simply a concept or an idea. And you can check this by listening for some key phrases that people might use in describing their idea about God. You, you might hear things like this. Well, my view of God is such and such. Or I like to think of God as blah, blah, blah. Or my concept of God includes this particular idea. It's entirely understandable because if they have not grown up with a true understanding of God's revelation, if they've grown up without any real instruction in the Bible, then of course they're tempted to view God exactly as they conceive of him. Someone once said that in the beginning, God made man in his own image, and ever since then, we've been trying to remake God in our image. Think about that for just a second. So, some people would like to see God as something of a cheerleader. All right, we all, do we all know what cheerleaders are? La La Dwe, right, in Chinese. I think that's a hilarious name in Chinese. I love that. So, uh, we, we think of God as just somebody who's supposed to stand on the sidelines and, you know, shout lovely little phrases to cheer us on. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You know, just kind of cheer us up when we're down. For others, people, uh, God is like a waiter in a restaurant, ready to serve you when you have some need. Mostly in the background, we don't want waiters always at our table, but we love for them to come when we raise our hands, right? When I raise my hand, the waiter should show up. And there they come, nice and helpful. For some people, that's the way they want their God, nice and helpful. Not actually involved in the regular daily events of your life, but available as necessary. Or maybe God for you, or for some people, is more like a landlord, okay? Your landlord uh, just may not even live in your building, may live somewhere else, but they have a phone number and you can call them when things go wrong, especially when things go wrong. If the AC quits working, you give them a call. If the toilet gets clogged up, you give them a call. If something goes wrong in the middle of the night, you give them a call, you call the landlord. But most of the time, it's completely out of sight. You don't have to worry about the landlord. If you listen carefully, you'll find that most people treat God in much the same way. Not the God of the Bible. So, how is it that our culture is increasingly less religious and at the same time, more and more spiritual. Do you find that interesting? I do. How do you explain that? It's because of this vacuum that has been created. When we cease to believe in the God as he's made himself known, then we don't just believe in nothing, we believe in everything. So people are looking for a way to try and fill this gap this vacuum, so the businessman will call out to God for a little success, okay? We see this in local religions as well. It's not just in the Christian religion, it's in all religions. Uh, someone who's sick will call out to God for a little bit of healing. The student will call out to God for success in their exams. The lonely person will call out to God for help in their relationships. In each case, the person affirms that there is something there but they don't really understand who he is. And yet, even those of us, maybe in this room, who affirm a true belief in the God of Scripture can sometimes live as practical atheists. Okay? So let's examine ourselves a little bit. So sometimes professing theists will say, I believe in God. He's really important to me. But when it comes to, say, filling in your tax returns when it comes to honesty, when it comes to purity, when it comes to obedience, when it comes to worship, when it comes to the actual application of the truth of God in real life, a professing theist may actually be living as a practical atheist because our belief has no implication, has no application to the reality of our life. And have you always also noticed this, that the God who's invented by us is always a non-judgmental God? 
when we invent a God, he's always kind and loving and helpful. If you ever notice people say, well, I don't like to think of God like that. You know, it says in the Bible, there is appointed unto man a day that he will face judgment. People say, well, I don't like to think of God like that. Well, of course you don't. Nobody does. Nobody wants to think of the day of judgment. I like to think of God as a Santa Claus. I mean, wouldn't you? But that's not reality. That's not how things work. We just don't take him seriously. We feel like we can call on him as necessary. We like to have a little bit of religion in our lives, but not too much. Just uh, 4.30 to 6 on Sunday. Then we can go on with the rest of our week. As if God somehow exists for us rather than us for him. At the very core of 1 Samuel chapter 4 is this mistaken notion, misplaced faith, that if we, that we can somehow manipulate God, that we can manipulate God into doing what we need him to do. The problem for the people here is not that they have a wrong view of God, but that their understanding of God has been skewed over the course of time. So let's dig into this chapter. Let me make a few comments. The opening sentence, the word of Samuel came to all Israel, is probably the conclusion to chapter 3. Uh, we know that the word of God is now going to be coming through the lips of the prophet Samuel and is going to be going out into all Israel. He speaks from God. He speaks for God. And Samuel has already declared a word of judgment even, right? That what's going to happen Eli, Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are going to die. They're going to die on the same day. And we just read in this passage what happened. Hophni and Phinehas died on the same day. God's judgment was pronounced. God's judgment was executed. But now we bid farewell to Samuel, okay, until chapter 7. And the context or the camera lens turns and focuses now on the ark of God. And we read now that Israel went out to battle. We don't really know exactly why they went out to battle. Maybe it's a territorial dispute or something like that. This place, Aphek, from the best we can tell, is about 20 miles. Sorry, I still live in English or American uh, measurement units. Uh, what's that? 44 kilometers, give or take. Martin can be my translator for that. Uh, anyway, a little ways, a little ways more in kilometers. Um, so anyway, so they're from Shiloh, and you remember Shiloh is the place where God has set up uh, for the people to come and meet Him. That's why Eli was set there, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. the The Ark uh, was well. I'll say a little bit more about that in just a second. So. Uh, we don't have a lot of details. We just know that the lines are drawn up. And when the battle was fought, the first battle, Israel is defeated. Now, that's the interesting point here because Israel, in its history, was not used to being defeated. Israel wins. Almost always, Israel wins. And if you know, in the earlier parts of the Old Testament, uh, God manifested his power in the victories that Israel won. So... When the people come back to the camp from losing this battle, the elders of Israel pose this question that I already pointed out. Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? It's the right question, isn't it? They understood that God was sovereign over victory and defeat, that they had lost and God was sovereign over this fact. But... <clears throat> where they made a mistake was they didn't make a connection between their disobedience and their defeat. They didn't make a connection between their disobedience and their defeat. First of all, in Leviticus, in chapter 26, from verse 14 or so, uh, Leviticus 26, 14, he says, If you will not listen to me, and if you will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes, if your soul abhors, abhors my rules, so that you will not do all my commandments, but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. 
He says, I will set my face against you. You shall be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee when none pursues you. In Deuteronomy 28, you'll find the exact same thing. We've already learned in the first few chapters of 1 Samuel that things were a mess, weren't they? Eli had failed in his leadership. He had two sons who were misappropriating their position in the temple. They were robbing people of their rightful, uh, of the meat as they were being sacrificed. They were taking what was not theirs. And God is now going to punish them. God has made this clear. It's a mess. And God appears to Samuel and said, the word that I spoke to you is the word that is going to be fulfilled. And Eli had received that word and apparently done nothing with it. And now they are defeated in battle. And the elders say, why has the Lord defeated us today? Their question was right, but then the solution is wrong. Notice what they do. They say, let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh. What's wrong with that? There's no acknowledgement of sin. There's no appeal for mercy. Instead, they have this mistaken notion with them that if they just have a talisman, the symbol of God's presence with them, then everything will be all right. If they have the ark, then God must be duty-bound to show up and pulverize their enemies. But they're wrong. It's misplaced faith. It's the same kind of misplaced faith that we can have today in religious expressions where people think that by some external expression of religion, I do this, therefore God does that. I do this, I act this way, therefore God owes me this. I give God this, therefore God should give me that. But these, gods were, these, these people were on the wrong side of God's desire for them, and they knew they were defeated. There was no cry for mercy, just let's get the ark. The ark was a chest about, as best we can tell from the measurements, probably like this by this and the same width. And it, it was decorated in pure gold. It had cherubim over the top, and it was to be the place, uh, it was kept in a place where no one was supposed to mess with it. And no one was to ever touch it. It was to be carried on poles. And there's a place in the Old Testament where someone thinks it's going to stumble and fall and they reach out and touch it and they're immediately killed. It was, it was to be the place that represented God's presence among the people. God says, tell the people, there I will meet you. It will be the symbol of my presence. When Moses goes out and leads the people and sets forward once the ark has been made, he sets forward with the ark and he says this, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. If there's going to be victory, it will be because you have arisen, O Lord, not because we're carrying, uh, okay, this is not in the scriptures, this is me talking. He says, not because we're carrying this box, but we know that it is the symbol of your presence. We know that it is the place you will meet us. But without you, the box doesn't matter. That's the bottom line. Without God, the box doesn't matter. And that's what they had got wrong. They had replaced faith in the living God with superstition. They had replaced faith in the living God with superstition. They were no longer prepared to bow down to God's righteous judgment, no longer prepared to acknowledge their sin before God and call upon him for mercy. Some people uh, call this rabbit foot theology. Do you guys know what a rabbit foot is? I don't know that rabbit foot are popular anymore, but when I was a boy, people would carry around a rabbit's foot. I, now that I think about that, that is so gross. <laughs> but you could buy these in the stores, like a cut off rabbit's foot, and it was a keychain. And actually, uh, I read about this this week. In order for the superstition of the rabbit foot to truly give you good luck it couldn't be just any cut off rabbit's foot it had to be cut off in a certain way at a certain time you can go look it up this week i, I didn't write it down because i 
I didn't want to bring it up anyway. But it's, it, there were all these rules about how the rabbit foot had to be prepared in order to actually have truly good luck for you. But you know, people still do that today. Um, if you walk down the street out here tonight and you look on the scooters, what will you find hanging off most of the scooters? The little red uh, bag with a blessing or a charm from the temple? And some people here in Taiwan will even carry one in their wallet or in their purse. You see, we're, it's, it's so easy for us to pick up these superstitions and you can say, if I, if I just do this, then I'll be okay. They had replaced reverence with God with reverence for the box, with reverence for the ark. But if you dump reverence for God and all you've got is reverence for the ark, then frankly, you've got nothing. You've got nothing. So they send word back to Shiloh saying to Eli, we want the ark. And Eli should have known better, but he didn't. And he sends the ark with who? Hophni and Phinehas, of all people to send the ark with. I mean, can you imagine a more pathetic picture in all your life than these two worthless, he's already, they've already been called out as worthless sons. And he sends the two worthless sons with the Ark of the Covenant of God, thinking this is going to make a difference. And when they show up in the camp, of course, the Israelites all go nuts. They scream out in joy, thinking, our salvation is here. Now everything's going to be okay. As a matter of fact, it was so loud that the reaction of the Philistines in their camp is, we're in real trouble here. But they can be forgiven to some degree because their religion believed that gods actually showed up like this. So they had a belief that maybe a real God had shown up in the Israelite camp. They were taking the ark for God. But why should we be surprised? Because the Israelites were doing the same thing. Interestingly, the Philistines don't retreat you would think that they would back off at that point and say, well, we're done. But they didn't. They actually mustered their courage and go against the Israelites again and really defeat them. In the first battle, what was it? 6,000 people died? 4,000 people died? In the second battle, 30,000 Israelites are killed. So the ark clearly was not the answer. Going to get the ark, trusting in its presence, was a bad plan and led to a dreadful slaughter. Israel was defeated. The army melted away. Every man to his own home, it says. There was a great slaughter. And the text mentions two in particular. Of the 30,000 people who died, two were named, Hophni and Phinehas, dead, to clarify the Lord's pronouncement of judgment. If you're reading this on your own, you might be sitting here and saying to yourself, I wonder why they would mention, and the two sons of Eli died out of all these thousands of people. Well, because it was the sign of God's judgment. The text had to clarify that God's judgment is always right and always kept. Misplaced faith. The Israelites thought they could trust in the presence of the ark while paying no attention to God's demands. That's not so far removed from today. You and I can do the exact same thing. Again, we read these Old Testament stories sometimes and we'd like to point our finger and say, man, those people were so dumb. I would never do anything like that. Let's be careful. Let's be really careful. Let's take a hard look at ourselves. You may not be trusting in an ark, but you may be trusting in something else. Maybe you're trusting in your baptism. Some people do that, you know. 
Some people say, well, you know, it doesn't really matter what I do. I was baptized. I'll be okay. Some people say, well, you know, I remember when I walked the aisle of the church. I remember when I went down front and the pastor prayed for me and I stood in front of the congregation and so that's what I'm counting on. We're about to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Some people count on that. Some people say, well, you know, I just, I just every, every month I take the Lord's Supper and that wipes it all away. It's not how this works. That's, that's treating this like magic. And it's not. It's not magic. God is the one who weighs the actions of our heart. He weighed the actions of Phineas and Hophni and pronounced judgment on them. And that's very solemn. Basically, their trust in the ark meant nothing so long as they paid no regard for God's call to obedience. It's quite chilling, actually. Now, does that mean we're all in danger today of being struck down? If it were, then we would all be struck down. Okay, let's, let's just acknowledge the honest truth. If, if this story is a, is a uh, analogy or a, metaphor or a picture of what would happen in all times and all places, then the reality is, just get ready, we're about to all be finished. The good news I have for you today is that someone was struck down. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was struck on your behalf. He paid the penalty for your sin on the cross. That's, that's the message of the cross is that Jesus took the punishment that you and I deserve so that we could live in forgiveness and freedom. That's the message of the gospel. So you don't have to worry. God's not threatening judgment. If you're a believer here tonight, God's not threatening this kind of judgment on you. What God is actually asking of you is your obedience. Jesus said in the New Testament, if you love me, you will, do you remember? Obey my commands. Keep my commands. If you love me, you will obey my commands. That's, that's what Jesus asks. Matthew Henry in the 17th century closed out his sermon on this passage this way. He said, let none think to shelter themselves from the wrath of God under a, the cloak of a visible profession, like I was baptized, I did this, I did that. Let none think to shelter themselves from the wrath of God under the cloak of a visible profession, for there will be those cast into outer darkness who have eaten and drunk in Christ's presence. You remember what Jesus said, I'm going to eat with you now, and one of you is a devil. So I ask of all of you tonight, we're about to eat and drink the Lord's table. Are you part of the family? Are you one of the 11? Are you with Christ? Or are you against him? Are you included in the family tonight? Now is the time to confess your sins and make things right with God.